Hello everybody and welcome to Joining a Fan Channel. Now this is a very, very special video where I have the pleasure to unbox a brand new Jellyfish product. What? 2022 and we're still kicking out the Jelly Jams. It's uh, it's very exciting. So I have with me, uh, as I click a button to get rid of something, um, I have with me the one and the only Roger Joseph Manning Jr. It is always a pleasure and uh, yeah, how are you doing? I'm I'm doing well, thank you. I'm I'm making music, and it's a sunny day in LA, and I cannot complain. I'm excited that this box set has come out for the fans, and uh, you know, Licorice Quartet continues to gain attention and, and uh, make some folks happy out there. So I'm in a good place. Ah, uh, yeah. I've uh, before we get into it. Uh... The album, the Licorice Quartet album, just arrived, and I love the uh, the bonus tracks. And um, oh, yeah, cool. yeah, I actually got it before Volume Three, so I'm I'm um, I'm excited for Volume Three and all the uh, the related paraphernalia to uh, come through the door as well. Because you can't see it. This is all professional wrestling. I, I haven't really done much of a, a background for this, but over there is like Licorice Quartet, Imperial Drag stuff, and uh, yeah. Jellyfish is elsewhere. I swear I'm a fan. Um, put it that way. So, <laughs> um, you, know, you you attacked me in Manchester, so I know you're a fan. <laughs> what I loved, I don't know if we brought this up or not, but I was I was chatting with you, and you were like, "Look, there's Beck," and I was just like, "Yeah, whatever." Um, <laughs> ah, I can meet Beck anytime. It's fine. Um, <laughs> you seem like the type of person that's very easy to meet. Maybe not. Um, so uh, he's, anyway, he's a sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a great gig as well. Um, so from a uh, Newland uh, Records, uh, and this isn't in your hot little hands yet, uh, dear public, but uh, I have been honoured because I've uh, been helping out with the product a little bit. Here it is. Thank you for your contributions. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Here it is, all shiny and uh, unopened. And I'll be honest, I am a nerd. This one will stay closed. <clears throat> um <laughs> So this, uh, just so you know, because uh, we're gonna we're gonna run through the singles and get uh, Rogers like a, maybe a little story about each single or something like that. But um, the sticker on the front uh, is not on the shrink wrap; it's actually on the box. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing the whole peely thing and maybe accidentally ripping the shrink wrap and all that kind of thing. So um, they, they think of everything, these guys. So seven multicolored seven inch singles housed inside a deluxe lift off box lid, 64 page book featuring essays, in-depth interviews with band members, previously unseen photographs and rare memorabilia, exclusive 3D poster with custom jellyfish 3D glasses limited to 1000 copies worldwide. So, Let's start with the box before we open this. Um, now, this is an unseen photograph of you and Andy. Uh, this had never been seen before. So what are your memories of this shoot? And uh, was it a last minute decision to stand on the uh, the phone books uh, to raise your height a little? <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, I don't remember really anything about this shoot other than it was probably taken uh, during the Spilt Milk band photos with Tim and Eric. Um, definitely that's, I remember having that outfit then and wearing my hair that way. So it had, it had to have been right before the Spilt Milk album came out. Was, what might have this been pre, um, cause there's one eight by 10 out there with a, a, a close up of yourself and Andy. Uh, so would this have been between bands maybe? No, this was, it, I remember doing similar shots, uh, for the Ringo Starr promo stuff. Ah, uh, very cool. Around um, that era, I think I think there were several pictures taken because we were doing photo shoots with Ringo for that project and some other people, and then the photographer was like pairing off people. Ringo and Don was let's get one of you and Andy. Let's get one of you and Andy and Ringo. Blah blah blah. Ah, uh, very so cool. So that's really, my, that's my memory. So this was just a off the cuff, put in the archives, never thought yeah. about. After that, that's you know, really... whenever. I mean, obviously, and back then, whenever you had like a professional photographer that somebody was footing the bill for, you got you got <laughs> as much use out of it as possible. I understand that. <clears throat> um, so yes, lovely. Uh, this is the uh, this is the opened one, um, and it has 
all six of the seven inch singles on the back plus bonus single um so we're going to open the lid here we go i've never I, I i don't really do this kind of unboxing shit like i'm not really an influencer in that way and it's sold out so i don't know who this is selling to <laughs> everyone already has one but i thought this oh, is amazing. a great idea um I yeah the, the colored version is sold out and there's the uh the black vinyl version which uh because oh. You know, a lot of people were unhappy because it, it sold out so quickly. And the compromise is there is going to be another version. It kind of like how Omnivore did it with um, with Belly Button and Spilt Milk. There were there was an extra version of it. So as we open it, um, this is what you will see. So we start with the 3D glasses. I don't know if I won't wear that. Will that will give me a headache if I wear that? with a light ring on me all the way through, but, um, and it's got the lovely jellyfish. Jellyfish knew how to market. Get that logo on everything. And then Pablo will buy 10 of them. Um, so now this, this is beautiful. This is the 3D poster, which is based on the, uh, the 10 inch single of, I want to stay home, but also the, the store pop-up um display uh which is which is yeah. very rare and i'm assuming that they probably used mine to get this image for this poster um because i sent them down a lot of things so um this photograph though would be from the uh i guess the scary go round yeah the uh, now she knows she's wrong from a single so was there um at the time uh, any chat that you remember about the I want to stay home marketing because there wasn't a music video for that but there was a lot of really cool things like the pop-up 10 inch the 3d stuff what well that yeah that was the first that was the first single in the UK uh, uh -huh. which had nothing to do with what the American record companies did so we were a bit shocked but felt that if the British record companies were excited we should let them run with that um, it seemed to get a good reaction, but yeah, there was no video because we'd already, we'd already done two videos in America for King is Half Undressed and that is why. Um, mm. So we didn't have a video ready to go for that. And, uh, but they, you know, they wanted to kind of build slowly with, I want to stay home being the second signal. And that's when you got the 3D and pop-up elements. Were, were you surprised when the Rod Stewart version ended up on a, rarity cd eventually um absolutely I, I i mean it was cool as hell I, and i it you know it's always it was very amazing back then when anybody of note uh seemed to notice us and care enough to want to do a cover of the song or take a picture with us or something Rod Stewart's tons of fun. I would love to meet Rod Stewart. My mom said she claimed she met Rod Stewart at a at a, a I guess a petrol pump. Um, he had like a bright yellow something with like his girlfriend who was like about forty years his junior, and uh, yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the first, the next thing you'll see is this fe rather fetching book <clears throat> with the jellyfish uh, promo sticker image on the back. Now, this is another photo shoot that I don't... This is very early 90s because it's very bleached. Um, that seemed to be the thing to do in the early 90s with these images. Uh, lots of white, <laughs> I think. Um, so <clears throat> do you remember... I mean, the the, the outfit is tremendous. Uh, did you keep that for a long time? And uh, do you remember anything about this particular shoot? Uh, that was just one of many uh, belly button era shoots. I mean, that's probably that's probably well into the project, though. I mean, that's probably uh, a few months into the release of the first record. Um, <laughs> but uh, Chris makes you look conservative here. <laughs> yeah, that's part. Of, that's part of why it was important that he was in the band. <laughs> he he. Uh, he definitely and like liked the theater aspect of this project, and mm -hmm. um, you know it was a, no one no one put a gun to his head. It was an extension <laughs> of his personality for sure. 
Yeah, I can. I, well, I got to interview him and he had the hat in the background from the album cover and I was just like, oh, that's so cool. Um, you don't have your album cover gear anymore, do you? Because um... uh, No, I, I sold it to a fan, actually, uh, who I actually know and lives in Southern California. So if I really wanted to, <laughs> I'm, I'm coming. Me, me borrow it in a second. That's great. I'm coming to um, LA. Uh, Southern California is probably, I forget that everywhere is hundreds of miles away from anywhere. So I, I doubt I'd be able to make it down there to look at your old stage costumes or anything like that. But uh, I did an unofficial jellyfish tour last time I was there. So I might try and do that again this time. And uh, yeah, I <laughs> went to East West Studios and Vasquez Rocks. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. So we're not going to go through every page of this, but. Uh, there are interviews with yourself, uh, with, with with all of the band, and there's a page of quotes from Andy uh, at the back, because you can't not. Um, and uh, there's a very hefty discography in here as well, which does incorporate, it's all the singles, but it does incorporate like the Bye 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 single and uh, the flexi discs and all that kind of thing. So um, there's, lots, there's lots of pictures just like there's very cool outtakes i'm not like say you got to wait until it comes through your door but there's uh, a lot of memorabilia um lots of flyers uh yeah did you um when you were on tour did you sort of make sure to keep any poster that you saw of yourself at a venue or did you see things like on the road that you'd never seen before like uk editions of things all that yeah, kind of stuff I did, I did that for a while yeah um by the time, well, no, I mean, I, I kept stuff when I could. It was hard to transport it. And it, you know, it was hard enough making sure your suitcase didn't get lost. Um, so I tried throwing small stuff into my suitcase was no problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some of the larger posters, which were really cool and I don't know, record company displays or, or props that the record company had. Um, I tried to collect as much of that stuff over the years. Um, and uh, I do still have a good percentage of it. Uh, some of it, like surplus, you know, I put up for uh, sale with fans and so forth that I've collected, you know, my, my personal collection. And, um, yeah, but I've definitely kept, uh, you know, one of everything, save some of my costumes, um, so they could be buried with me. <laughs> <laughs> like Tutankhamun or something, right? Right, um... right, exactly. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, just a couple of things in here. I mean, this is the this is the promo shot that we're talking about. A, a, a oh, right, yeah. tremendous amount of conditioner uh, used yeah. uh, during this time period. Would they would they like look as sultry and sexy as possible? Because I mean, no, that was just us. We were young. Men. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and we, we uh, hadn't grown beards. We kept our, yeah. our baby face. This is true, but also here's Andy very stubbly. This feels like it's like near the end of a tour and everyone's just tired at this point. Um, well, we were, yeah, and we had probably been out with the Black Crows, so we were a little more exhausted. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, sorry, that was the first album. Yes, that it was. was. Not, that, that's Spilt Milk Tour. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the Spilt Milk touring was more intense. and. Um, well, you were doing two shows a day a lot of the times with the acoustic. Yeah. Sets. Yeah, and and less interruptions, and uh, yeah, that stuff catches up with you. Um, if you're not sleeping right, and we were we were touring a lot more in Europe and overseas, Japan, Australia, mm. uh, and none of us were used to jet lagging. No, I can I can imagine. Now there were some um, there were some shows that were recorded. Uh, for TV, for German TV, or for radio. And obviously the Bogarts uh, album came out of that. So, I mean, you know, I I don't know if you could tell us this or not, but, you know, you've got a sound desk there. You've got a mixing desk, multi-channel thing. Was the, like Metallica, I guess, like sort of a conscious thought to maybe record more gigs as you went along, or was it just not even thought about? No, it wasn't thought about. It it, it was... um... I, you know, I think if they were recorded, it was because our sound man, Shalom, had the force, foresight, forethought to um, do something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, we certainly weren't 
even thinking in those terms, which is a bit foolish. But he um he had the the best quality version of the Jules Holland uh performances as well, and uh, yeah, I think everyone goes back to those all the time because one they look and sound so great um but yeah it's it's uh, you know uh just a wonderful performance so i mean i know you had to cut bye 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 um was there any disappointment about that or was that you just knew those were the breaks with that kind of thing because there was like a verse missing you know I've, I've, there was always disappointment but also simultaneously we couldn't believe that we were being given these opportunities i mean we were huge fans of that show and jewels in general because we were all squeeze fanatics mm -hmm. and um uh, and that was uh it still is i mean he, I, don't, I think it's still active um it is yeah you know he, it'll never go <laughs> well he had such great combinations of artists uh so we always looked forward to being a part of that I, i've done it at least twice with beck maybe three times i'm trying to rem remember and uh it's always such a pleasant surprise to be a part of that whole world do you know what my favorite thing about that video is at the end leonard cohen is uh applauding you <laughs> isn't that great <laughs> unbelievable yeah oh good stuff so anyway let's get into the singles um so these are the order in which they come out of the box <clears throat> so i don't know if this is american single order you may you'll be able to correct me on this if not so king is half undressed first yeah uh, now this that, that's American yeah. American order so this is on a, a lovely purple vinyl uh, as you'll see and you've got I'll not do this for all of them but on the back on the uh, B side which has no audio on the B side it's all on the A side um, you've got the image of the single and then you've got all the information on the front and they're in lovely unspoiled card because all our singles now are like 30 years old and there's going to be a bit of creasing going on which shows that they've been played uh, a lot I love the colour combination of this, it's so loud and gaudy and as you can tell I've got like orange and purple wallpaper so this goes a treat <laughs> against it because I've got like a 12 inch uh, version of it um, so this, I'm guessing a continuation of the toothpaste idea from the Belly Button album cover Yeah, like a you know, I mean the art directors at uh... Charisma Virgin, when we first got signed over there, were really on board with everything, and, and um, we got very lucky that way. So they, they ran with as much of the thematic stuff as they could, depending on the budgetary constraints. So, And uh, also, uh, a Jello pack was made for this, and for that is why as well. I'm, I'm determined. I don't think a Jello pack exists now with any of the liquid in it. Yeah, it's all dehydrated, evaporated. <laughs> So how squishy was it? I mean, it, it feels like it should be the type of thing that would wreck your CD, like immediately. Um, but yeah. I think they've held up quite well. Like, well, the CD the CD wasn't exposed to any of the liquid. No, that's true. But it just you would think it's like having a balloon filled with water or something. You would think it would pop at any moment or something like that. You know, uh, it was a little more gelatinous than water. Uh, Got you, but not not much, and because it had, you know it had floating glitter inside. <laughs> uh, which was a hell of a package. I don't even want to know what that cost everybody, including us. <laughs> I think Jason mentioned on the about the belly button album cover, like you can't believe how much it cost to have the trifold <laughs> version of it. Just that extra one piece of cardboard just yeah. was like a crazy thing. Um, yeah, but yeah. they were they were willing to try these things, and you know we're forever indebted to them being willing to do that. It's very cool. Oh, I, I love it. I mean, when I was buying singles, there weren't any experimental packagings at that point. Um, you know, DVD singles had come into, into fashion, but there certainly weren't uh, like gimmicks like nappy packs and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I don't even know any of a band that would have had stuff as wild as uh, Jellyfish. Uh, you know, is there any other band that you know, like even contemporaries of the time that had things like nappy packs and jello packs and all that kind of thing? Not not contemporaries. I mean, we were, of course, inspired by a, a bygone era of uh, posters and vinyl sleeves and, and uh, mm. you know, all kinds of promotional items and things like that. I mean, I suppose, you know, you've usually seen things... Uh, when record stores were still a viable way of 
selling product. You'd see display, you know, clever things. And sometimes record stores would enjoy being creative with their employees, but it was more of a seventies, eighties kind of thing. Oh, I'm glad that, uh, it, it, loving the music, I mean, the music is first and foremost, but the fact that Jellyfish are like the most fun band to collect is um, <laughs> why I've been doing it for, for next, next to Kiss. Next to, oh, oh, okay. No, that's, yeah, I can see the influence obviously there as well. No Jellyfish condoms yet or like caskets or anything like that, but uh, no. I wouldn't have room for a Jellyfish casket. <laughs> I wouldn't go with the theme. <laughs> <laughs> um so um and obviously king is half dressed original seven inch single uh so it is backed with calling sarah and uh we move on to babies coming back i wonder what these babies are now maybe one of them became like a governor or a mayor or something like that or like you never know yeah, yeah. You, you never hear of like any I, I would like to think that like um maybe aston butler or something like that was one of these babies <laughs> You know, I guess they wouldn't know. It, trivia. I know it, it reeks of exploitative parents. This, <laughs> I'm guessing you didn't know any of the babies. Nope. Okay. I knew nothing, of, I knew nothing about how that album cover was created. Now, this predates Nevermind, I think. I think it does in terms of Naked Baby. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's, uh, it's 90. It's 90. So, um, no, no kickback off. Naked babies. I don't think we were the first person to have infants involved in their artwork. First band to have infants in the artwork. But uh, uh, yeah, nor do I have any evidence that they were inspired in the least by <laughs> us or that video. <laughs> it's very cute. And um, oh, it's backed with All I Want Is Everything, uh, recorded live at the Roxy. Uh, Jack Joseph Puig involved in that. And uh, yeah. Good stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna rush through these. Um, now, scary go round. This was the first ever jellyfish thing that I ever bought. Uh, the seven inch scary go round. Well, photo shoot is directly from the UK. I mean that that's us. The I believe, first or second time we were ever in England. Oh really? So wh where was this in particular? Was it just in the studio? It wasn't outdoors. Some warehouse, either. yeah, some warehouse in some town. I have no idea. <laughs> and because uh, I was still learning the. Uh, geography of your country at the time uh -huh. um but uh i remember photographer had this idea and we we were kind of like well that's a that's that's okay we didn't have any better ideas we weren't particularly excited about it but the photo shoot all the photos that came from that shoot came out really good we were very happy with the whole mm. result at the end of the day and uh so, you know, you just never know. And uh, Chris on his Facebook page has some outtakes from this uh, photo shoot as well. It's well, oh. well worth checking out. Um, and obviously you get with this being an EP. Uh, was there a decision behind it being an EP instead of a single? Um, no, I think they were just looking for ways to continue to make their promo campaign different than the one in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um any anything that they could do to offer something different you know the markets always do that japan does the same thing they just try to increase the uh purchasing incentive for the fans absolutely well the um all different uh versions of the ep came with different tracks uh so this one uh now she knows she's wrong is the uh the, the lead track bed spring kiss is the uh the second track she still loves him uh live i'm guessing at the roxy i could be wrong about that i do apologize if i am and uh, baby's coming back live is the is the fourth track and uh yeah value for money four tracks and i'm guessing this this will be double-sided i could be wrong on that i would have thought so if it's four tracks um side one the side b of a side yes Yes, it is. See? Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, wonderful. So, and, and one of my favorite little bios on the back as well. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, now we've talked about I Want to Stay Home. I'm guessing you don't know the house. No. I, I, <laughs> I have no idea what the source of any of that stuff is for the art director. These are the questions that need to be asked, you see. Um, and I love the... Somebody it's kind of did ask that question back then. I just don't don't remember the answer. <laughs> well, it's very unlike 
all of the other jellyfish um, artwork. Like it doesn't look like a jellyfish single compared to the other uh, to the other well, images, you know, right? Other than the very large uh, violet poppy field, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, but it doesn't have like the the jellyfish logo one and stuff like that. It, but I mean, like, it may not have worked with this kind of um, with this kind of setup. But uh, it's an impressive image. I've got a poster of this. It's uh, it's it's a beautiful uh, image and the sentiment of the song as well. It's just. It is. It's the ultimate chill out song, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a wonderful song. So uh, that is belly button. Uh, so we move on to spilt milk, and we start with ghost at number one, a very inventive <laughs> uh, single cover, which I very much like. Uh, Back with all this forgiven, so quite a heavy, uh, quite a heavy single. Um, yeah, a little more distortion happening. And of mm. course, that album covers an extension of, uh, you know, the artwork on Spilt Milk and trying to continue with that theme. So we were very happy about that. Eric, someone pointed out to Eric Scotus that the Boy or Girl uh, single, the, the the prism of colors, actually, if you connect it to the album, it actually follows on. I don't know if you'd ever noticed that. Eric didn't know this before and it blew his mind. Uh, it continues on as one long image. Oh, I'm... Yeah, I remember that. So, uh, yeah, he was just, he was like, I was today years old when I found that out. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I I mean, I love this song for a start, but I know Andy's talked about uh, he thought Fan Club maybe should have been the first single. Obviously, the music video was a source of controversy in Europe because you weren't wearing uh, motorbike helmets. And uh, that's when you had to do the second version of the video. Uh, was that like a huge source of frustration or were you, did you believe in Ghost at Number One as the lead single compared to Fan well, Club? I'll be totally honest with you. When Belly Button came out, it was customary for most promotional campaigns to ease the public in with a starter song mm -hmm. with the idea that song number, that was going to build attention and then start the second song was going to be the slam dunk home run. Uh, that was the song that was really going to solidify the hit factor for the group. Mm. Three years later, by the time Spilt Milk came out, things had changed a bit in the record business, music business, in that there were a lot more bands fighting for airplay, fighting for MTV play. And you'd be, you'd be lucky to get two chances, let alone three. Like, again, like we and a lot of other groups did in the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, we still had the same kind of mentality as did the record company. Let's let's ease the fans in with a first song. We didn't, we weren't, ultimately we weren't given that chance because Ghost at Number One did not do as well as say King is Half Undressed did as the first song. Yeah. So. To me, it was, you know, a real shame, kind of hindsight's twenty twenty. that, no, we should have gone, you know, new mistake immediately. Uh, oh, really? Which, well, okay. Yeah. And I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong here or that anybody could have possibly known or had a crystal ball, but we, we always knew new mistake was going to be the second single. And we always knew that new mistake was um, more kind of sing along and, and, cheery in that way and maybe more um i don't know commercially appealing hmm. but we didn't we didn't want to uh kind of go out with it was just a different mentality different thinking and we didn't realize that the business had changed so much because basically we weren't given a second chance in other words ghost at number one didn't do the business everybody would have liked so now nobody was interested in trying much for new mistake so we, we we'd gotten rid of all of our our power our our, our uh, you know uh, the military strategy for this campaign uh got blown out with the first song oh uh, there's a, there is a quote from andy where he says well after i prized my hands away from the director's uh throat uh, for suggesting that that be the video idea for Ghost Number One, um, I was able to compose myself, and you know, New Mistake was obviously a. He, he loved the New Mistake video, 
Um, and I think he probably, I think everyone probably enjoyed the Ghost in the One video, but then again, the reaction, but you know, because there was uh, there was needles and uh, people not being safe on the road and all that kind of thing. We're a very uh, conservative country. In the early nineties, we were. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but I like this second video because you get to see Eric and Tim play their instruments on video yeah. instead of instead of sitting on a rock staring out into the desert. <laughs> uh, we we learned a lot, and one of the things we learned was we didn't trust anybody with our music. Mm. So we, as you can tell from the demo phase, we spent so much time getting as much of our thoughts out captured in those the demoing process Mm -hmm. because we felt if we got it as correct as we could possibly given the equipment and limitations we had then there'd be very little room for error when you actually took it in the studio Uh and having worked with jack and albie before come spilt milk we certainly trusted them but we didn't really want to leave too much open to interpretation uh, because we had to live with it. And we're the ones that had to be with the success and any potential shortcomings of it. So um, we unfortunately did not spend that time with video world. We really did give that power over to other people who were more practiced and experienced. We weren't yeah. practiced as filmmakers. We weren't practiced as, art directors and set designers and cameramen. We could speak and, and have intelligent, well thought out vision for our music. But unfortunately we didn't have that for the visual and certainly the video side. I, I've since worked with many, many artists mm. who sometimes spend more time you know, on the visual side of their presentation than they did in the recording studio. And of course, those who do it the best are versed in all those areas and they don't leave anything open to interpretation to anybody art director record company manager they go in the very clear vision not that the vision won't change Mm. but it starts from a place where they're a hundred percent this is what's going to work for me you know i'm going to be okay having scenes like this or having this tone in my videos having this attitude portrayed, you know, all, all the things that we were simply too naive to think through or frankly had that much interest in because we were so immersed in the you know, lyrical and musical presentation. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, so speaking sometimes of- it came to bite us in the butt. And then by then it was too late. You know, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent. And then it's like, well, here's our video. You got to <laughs> use it as your promo piece. Mm-hmm. At least, with a, at least with a photo shoot, sometimes you could go, these photos came out crap. We're not, let's go, let's spend the money and go try it again with somebody else. You know, it's like a fraction of the cost, but videos cost so much money back then. And it's a, it's a part of, you know, the history of jellyfish and it's an important part. And, uh, and we love it for, you know, for it being a part of that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it works for the song, I think, you know, but again, look, if I was in my early to mid twenties, I'm sure I would have, you know, not had a clue well beyond, you know, my experience was nominal, you know, compared to yours at that point as well. So I can't criticize anything like that, you know, and uh, I think people forget as well that being in your early to mid twenties, that's what you were. Cause I mean, you know, I think people think that people are kind of frozen in time a little bit and, uh, you know, forget that, like, you know, and we'll don't have to go on this, but including like the breakup and whatever went into that and, you know, relationships and stuff like that. It's like, God, I, I mean, I'm not the person I was 10 years ago in terms of, you know, getting along with people or having arguments and the amount of pressure heaped upon jellyfish I'd imagine would have been insane. So, you know, and that's a whole, whole thing for a whole different day and because yeah, I like any, like any group i mean so many of the bands that we look up to and know about did most of their incredible work before the age of 30 and many were signed they were still in their teens yeah you know, it's easy to it's, forget it's that. kind of a miracle it's kind of a miracle half of them get as far as they do half the time 
Well, right. I mean, we watched the Bee Gees documentary. Oh, like two I love that. Ago now, right? Yeah. And <laughs> not only were they brothers, but they're basically were ready to, you know, not make a single musical note together again. Somewhere around, they'd barely hit twenty, <laughs> and they were they'd already peaked. They were already like been there, done that, and the world didn't know if they'd ever hear from them again. Mm. And the fact that they had a second life, so to speak, is a flat out miracle. And it was many years later. It really is. And uh, well, I'm so glad that the, the jellyfish um, thing continues to live on whilst you are also making incredible new music as well. So we've got the uh, we've got the two minute warning. So let's uh, we'll rush through this. So new mistake. Now we've went into this. Now, Eric and Tim both said that this is their favorite photo shoot. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, this was released everywhere. Uh you know, there are there probably more versions of this single than any other single. And it's backed with uh, He's My Best Friend. And uh, yeah, it's it's a, obviously a wonderful song. But do you remember anything about the shoot? Because it's it's quite it's quite odd. Uh, yeah, very much. Because, um, again, that was done in England. And um, I don't remember how we got in touch with the people in charge of the photo shoot or how that was all put together, how they found the uh, photographers, artists to do that. Um, but uh, they did include us and, and explain to us their vision, which we were excited about. Um, the whole thing took place in a uh, miniature village that I don't know if still exists, but resided somewhere in the British countryside that we had to drive quite far to. Mm. Um, but you know, in in America, we have Pee Wee or Putt Putt golf courses. Yeah, I don't know. If I think it was like like Lego World or something like that, maybe. Oh, I don't remember Lego being part of it, but okay. it would not be dissimilar to what a modern Lego world would be like. So we get to the last single, the bonus single, which is uh, "No Matter What" from Live at the Roxy, and uh, "Think About Your Troubles," the incredible, uh, incredibly beautiful cover of the Harry Nelson. A classic and i know you talked about in the in the fan club box set um back then about uh that you were going to be working with harry um and timing was obviously not great and he kind of passed away before you got the chance to uh do that and as well also the last recording of yourself and andy uh together so it's it's very historic um in that sense and this way yeah i know you said it was one of andy's finest vocal performances as well do you stand by that even today well i absolutely do and i mean he didn't he didn't have a bad vocal performance no that is true but, <laughs> but uh all that is to say um i think one of the reasons i said that is because him and harry's vocal stylings are so different and uh harry's music was so um, flooded with his personality. So for somebody to just step in and elegantly and effortlessly sing one of his songs with all that incredible nuance and subtlety, uh, you know, is a further testament to Andy's incredible vocal abilities. Absolutely. And uh, I remember one uh, review of Andy's vocals that he sang like his life depended on it. Um, and I, I can totally, uh, totally get that. And I mean, his voice is incredible on No Matter What as well. And uh, every time you did No Matter What, did you, you and uh, Jason share the riff at the start, or was were there sometimes where Jason just played it by himself? Because it would kind I don't of remember. I think, but I think it was left, right, left kind of thing. Mm -hmm. when we both joined, which I think is how the original. I, I don't remember. I think it uh, might have been, yeah. Uh, you know, thankfully for me, it's a very easy guitar riff, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, such a great song. And two inspired choices to round out the uh, the box set of uh, When Memories Fade. And uh, like I say, there will be still uh, copies available, the black version, which I think may be out in December. Uh, the, the colored version is sold out. You could probably, if you wanted to, find it on the secondary market at this point. It probably already is selling for like you know double or something like that because that's that's the world we live in, folks. Um, but uh, yeah, it. I, but I would say entirely worth it if you if you did miss out. But get the black version because it's uh, just as worth it. And um, 
and it'll sound new and shiny and fresh. And uh, and then you can take them to Roger and bother them and get them to sign all of them, which I very well might do at some point. When uh, I'll be in LA in October, so hopefully you you may be around. Yeah, um, should be yes. Oh, wonderful. So. I want to thank you, Roger, for uh, taking part in this uh, unboxing. And uh, of course. It, 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 it's insane to me. I mean, I get credited in it as get this uh, executive producer and jellyfish authority. So, you know, I'll um, I'll wear that with pride. And, uh, oh, I'm, I'm credited above the band in this. Um, I, I don't think, you what? know, see, I mean, yes, the band were kind of instrumental in this box set, but it was all me, really. Me, <laughs> me, 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 me. Um, <laughs> you and James, yeah. I want to sign some copies of this. So, you know, I want to, I'll lower the value by signing some copies of this. So, um, yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Roger. And uh, I don't what know. Do what, uh, Thanks for helping to uh, get the news out there to everybody. Oh, not at all. And uh, as always, I want to thank everyone on the Joining the Fan page page on Facebook and everyone who has subscribed to the YouTube channel. It's insane how much it's taken off. And uh, yeah, uh, we will be continuing to update with uh, archive interviews, reviews, uh, merch reviews, all that kind of really fun stuff. So yes, I want to thank you again. And from the one and only Roger Joseph Manning Jr., we will see you all next time. Cool, man. Thank you, Pablo. Bye, everybody. Thank you.